as I begin to study the text for today's services, write my sermon from, and contemplating back to the last few Sundays, we've been um, listening to Jesus have a confrontation with religious leaders in the temple grounds. We've listened to parables that Jesus have, has been reading to the chief priests and Pharisees. And I kept thinking, you know, I'm not sure I'm familiar. Like, Jesus isn't coming across as familiar to me. You know, um, he, he, I don't feel forgiveness from him. I, I don't, you know, feel like he's trying to change the hearts of those he's dealing with. You know, I, I know he is for the multitudes and the people listening, but I'm just not quite sure. And then I understood because I went to a book that we use in the Education for Ministry class. It's called Introducing the New Testament. In the second year, we read the entire New Testament, and there's a supplement book that comes with it, and it's by Mark Allen Powell. And so I was reading and flipping through um, the chapter on Matthew, and I came to this section where it was explaining sort of the differences and similarities of Matthew compared to the other three Gospels. And it said, Matthew exhibits a pronounced hostility towards the religious leaders from Jesus. And he pointed out that in Matthew's Gospel, there aren't any exceptions for positive examples of religious leaders like there are in the other Gospels. And in fact, they're really mostly portrayed as evil. You know, like they can't speak or think of anything. They're hardened inside. On the outside, they're godly, but on the inside, they're hardened. And the other thing that Ma uh, Powell points out is that um, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus never summons them to repent. And that's what I was sensing as I was thinking back. He never summons the religious leaders to repent. And in um, chapter 15, verse 14, Jesus counsels the disciples to leave them alone. So basically, they're made an example for us of people who have a hardened heart and who will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And the book goes on to explain you know, possibilities as to why the writer of Matthew portrayed Jesus in this way, and the religious leaders as well, the Jewish people. And one of the um, examples, or one of the thoughts, is that the writer of Matthew is a Jewish Christian, and in his time, you know, there's perhaps he was angry at his Jewish brothers who were not converting to Christianity. And so he had some anger, and there was the persecution happening. And so that was coming through, perhaps, in his writing. But uh, Powell also noted that there's been criticism of Matthew, that an unschooled reader who hasn't studied the Bible hasn't studied Christianity, could read Matthew's Gospel and come away thinking, boy, those Jews killed Jesus. That they, they are the ones that, that killed him and had him, had him put up on the cross. And, you know, that is not the intention of any of the Gospels or Matthew's Gospel. And it's not the truth. And in fact, understanding why Jesus did suffer and die upon the cross is key to us understanding who we are as Christians and the real and tangible gift that we have. In today's gospel, we're at a point only two or three days before Christ's death. And the religious leaders have had enough of Jesus. He's exposed their hypocrisy, he's challenged their authority, and they're now plotting to have him arrested and hopefully killed. And so they've partnered with the Herodians. Now the Herodians are only mentioned a couple of times in the New Testament. And it's thought that they are a Jewish political party that is in support of King Herod Antipas. And typically the Pharisees and Herodians are on opposite sides of their beliefs. They're Jewish, but they don't believe in tax taxation and various things in the politics, but they can unite on their opposition of Jesus, and so they come together to form this plot 
this trap for Jesus. They're going to corner him with this question that's a yes or no question, and whichever answer he gives, they've got him. Now, chances are better that Jesus, when he hears this question, he will side against paying this imperial tax. It's this tax that's the amount of one day's wage. It's paid once a year by both men and women, non-Romans. And it has to be paid with a particular coin called the denarius. And the denarius, while it represents a day wage, it also is a piece of propaganda. I mean, it has, a, it has a, um, the image of the emperor on one side and on the other side an inscription that says Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. And so what you know, the Jewish people are doing when they hold this coin is they're holding this propaganda that's claiming another god and they only believe in one god. And so they're pretty certain and when Jesus looks at this coin He's going to say, absolutely not, God will not approve of this. However, if he sides with paying the tax, that God's fine with you paying the tax, you should pay the tax, then the Jewish people who have come to believe that he is the Messiah, that he's going to usher in this new kingdom and conquer the Romans, they're going to start distrusting that. They're going to say, what are you doing? We're going to pay tax? I, I thought you were going to change this whole thing. And at that time, then the Pharisees can swoop in like they've been waiting and arrest him. So the dialogue goes like this. They come to Jesus and they, they say, tell us what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? And Jesus says, show me the coin that you use for the tax. And so they bring him a denarius. And he says, whose head and whose title? And they answer, Caesar's. And he says, then give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God things that are God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed. And they left and went away, empty-handed. Now, if the Pharisees and Herodians hadn't been rendered speechless, you know, they might have thought to ask a question they probably walked away with. They probably wondered, well, what are then the things of God? And Jesus usually didn't answer questions like that. He would counter, make them think a little bit. And so he might have countered with the question, well, whose image is on you? Because it's written in Scripture that God created mankind in his own image. And because of that, God loves each and every one of us distinctly for our diverse nature, for who we are, sins and all. God loves each and every one of us. And he's proven that by sending his son, Jesus, to die for our sins. God sent Jesus with the plan that he would ultimately die for our sins. And he would become the mediator of the new covenant that we now have with God. And the covenant was established for the people in Jesus' time and for each and every generation going forward. And it's solely by the grace of God, not by anything that we've done to earn it. We weren't even there 2,000 years ago. It's by the grace of God that we have in advance been forgiven for all of our sins. And we have the gift of living out our lives here on earth and into eternity in a full communion with God, our Creator. And what does God want in return? Jesus tells us. Jesus tells us the first commandment is that we love God. We love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. And the second commandment is that we love our neighbor as ourselves. 
Matthew's, Matthew Henry's commentary suggests, if our purses be Caesar's, our consciences, consciences are God. And God must have the innermost and uppermost part of our hearts. And we must render to God that which he is due. So we can ask ourselves, does that describe how we live? And ironically, many Christians will answer, sometimes. So why is this? I mean, this tremendous gift that we have. Why do sometimes we might live like that? Maybe it's because in America we have so many freedoms. You know, the freedom of religion being at the top of the list. And so understanding this amazing gift that we have with this amazing life that we are privileged to live in, this amazing amount of freedom, is kind of like explaining to a fish. Don't you get the gift of water that you have? Isn't it wonderful that you have water? And they're like, huh? You know, I'm just swimming along here. You know? Until that day they're caught by the fishermen and put and flopping around in the boat and then thrown back into the water. Do they know, wow, I have water. Wow, what an environment I've got. And they really accept it and honor it. So I tend to disagree with Powell. You know, when he indicated that in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus didn't call for the religious leaders to repent. Because I believe this is what Jesus was doing in the answer that he gave to them. And I believe that repentance is the challenge of our Gospel lesson we've been given today. See, we need to face the fact that our times in this world are changing. We can't count on the freedoms that we've had for the rest of our lives. And we really need to put God back into the lives of the people in this country, individual by individual. So let's take this opportunity to honestly take stock in our lives, ourselves, who we are as Christians, how we're living, and look for where we aren't putting God in the innermost, uppermost position in our lives. You know, have we allowed the secularism and consumerism of America to take our attention away from this? Now as we move on into the liturgy, we're going to read prayers, we're going to pray for one another, we're going to have this opportunity to confess to God. Many of us have read these prayers many times, so I invite you to listen to them and, and pray them with this in mind. You know, we have the opportunity to confess today, to repent, and to start making changes in our life today. And maybe the answer might not be sometimes, but it will be, I'm working. I've been in this congregation since I was six years old. And I can attest that this is a place where you will find God, that you will meet Jesus Christ, and you can receive the Holy Spirit here. You know, we are very, very blessed in this congregation to have many Christians among us who are amazing examples for us to follow. We have new Christians, and we have Christians who have been in community with God for 80 plus years. This is an amazing congregation to stay close to, and to come where you can grow in your faith and listen for God's call in your life. Amen. <laughs>